Being a volcano, our Father, our King, we just release a fresh new thing this night, Lord God, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would have for us. Father, we hunger for more of you. We thirst for more of you. Fill us up, Father God. Fall upon us now. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, I don't know what button you pushed, but don't do it again. (laughs) You know, we're continuing in a series that we started about a month and a half ago called Journeys. In that series of journeys, we've taken a walk with numbers of people in the Bible. And one of the things that they all have in common is that until they knew their final destination, they could never fulfill their destiny. And as we walk in life on journeys in our own lives, we know that there's people we meet along the way. But if we're only focused on the end, on where we're going, we miss so much of the rich opportunity. And for those of us who are in Messiah, we know our final destination, and that's why God has us living and fulfilling our destiny. But there's many who struggle that don't know. They don't know where they're going. And if I ask you the question tonight, do you know where you're going when you die? Some of you might say, I'm not sure. And I want you to be sure. And it's my job to make sure that you know that there's a choice out there. A choice in this journey that we call life to make a decision. A decision that once you make the decision as to what your destination is, you can then begin to flow in your destiny. Many of you live life unfulfilled. Searching, 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 always searching, never finding, because you don't know where you're going. And tonight we're going to take a walk with someone that many thought didn't know where he was going. Many thought he was a wanderer. Many thought he didn't pay attention. Many thought that he got it wrong. It's an interesting time of year for us to talk about Moses. Now, for many of you, this night is an occurrence of a day called Pentecost, and many of you will celebrate that day this Sunday. And for those of us that still focus on the rich biblical Jewish feast days, we know this day and this time is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And tonight we're going to take a walk with Moses on his journey through life and through his destination and his destiny. And there's no better time to talk about that than Pentecost. And you say, well, Moses certainly wasn't in the upper room. But I'm going to clue you in on something. His destiny was fulfilled that night. You say Moses' destiny was fulfilled in the upper room? Why, that was 1,400 years after his death. How can destiny be fulfilled so long after death? Well, you have to know the journey that Moses was on. You see, Moses' destination wasn't always secure. And for 80 years of his life, he did wander through life. Now, many of you focus on the fact that he didn't enter the promised land. And if you focus on that, then you limit the mighty power of God to deliver completely. You limit God in your expectation and in your anticipation of what he can do for you by saying, well, Moses, Moses was the one that came down from Sinai. Moses was the one that led the people out of Israel, Moses, out of Egypt. Moses was the one, Moses was the one, and Moses didn't get to enter the promised land, and I'll tell you, you were wrong. And when you read the Word of God, you imprint your expectation and your understanding on it because I seem to remember it was Moses standing with Elijah and Yeshua. I guess he made it after all, didn't he? (laughs) I guess when we look at God's big promise, we realize it's much bigger than what we expect, this land of milk and honey. He made it to heaven. He made it for eternity with the Holy One of Israel. I'd say he made it, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes. I like that. 
You know, when does the journey really begin? Does it begin at the beginning when you plan it? Does it begin at a time when you take that first step? And I've always said even the longest journey begins with the first step. And when we look at Moses' life, we realize that Moses was impetuous. He had somewhat of a volatile personality. He was pretty sure of himself. He was sure of himself until God called him to go do something. And isn't that the way for most of us? In the world, we're very strong and forceful, but then God calls us, we get timid and unsure. But God gives you the boldness. God gives you the strength. God gives you the equipment if you have the desire. And if you want to serve the Lord, and Moses eventually wanted to serve the Lord and answer the call, he kind of went back and forth with God just a little bit. But it's interesting as we study words in the Word of God, we realize how powerful words are. And we see that 40 years Moses lived in Pharaoh's environment, had a little encounter and went out to become a shepherd for 40 years. And just about the age of 80, God could finally use them. It's a reminder to those of you that are sitting out there that it's never too late. You're never too old. And it took Moses 80 years to get to his destination that secured his destiny. Because when we read about Moses in the beginning before God called him, We're reading about someone searching for a destination, searching for an identity, trying to figure out, is he Jewish in an Egyptian world? Is he Egyptian in a Jewish world? Who is he? Where does he belong? How does he belong? But when God finally got a hold of him, his destination became secure, and now he began to live out his destiny. And how interesting it is that what began at Shavuot, the first Pentecost, 50 days after the Exodus, what continued 1,400 years later in the upper room were basically the identical parallel events on identical days with the same kind of effects, sound effects, that occurred on the mountain occurred in the upper room. And something that Moses had said years ago was finally fulfilled on that night. And to walk this journey with Moses, we have to take a look in Exodus chapter 3 as to when and how it happened. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Hineni, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Termites. (laughs) And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I, it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? 
then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, many of you have tried to name God and called him Yahweh and Jehovah. And I appreciate that, but not a lot. If we remember in Genesis, God brought to Adam everything to name, and he said to him, name this, and you will have dominion over this. But there was one thing God did not bring to him to name, and that was himself. Because man does not have dominion over God, God has dominion over man. In the Hebrew mind, it's okay in my mind to not have a name for God. I am is sufficient. And if I can name him, I have dominion over him. Therefore, I make no effort to name him. For he's doing a pretty good job without my help. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered for generation to generation. This is the name. It took 80 years for Moses to be refined to the point of submission to a degree that God could use him in a mighty way. And I say to a degree because obviously he wasn't fully submitted. He was submitted to the extent that God could use him, and it's an encouragement to us that when we resist and we argue and we fight with God, that he can still use us if we're willing to submit to a degree. The more submitted we are, the more he can use us. God loves submission. And it was over the course of time that we read of the relationship that God had developed between him and Moses. In Exodus 33, 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Now, the dialogue between God and Moses went from one extreme of complete humility and obedience to another one of arrogance and impetuousness. And his journey was a rocky one. But yet, because Moses believed in God's plan that there was a promised land and that God would be the one to deliver them. Moses knew his destination. And because his destination was secure, he could flow in that destiny. He could walk in that destiny without fear as to how it was going to end because God has already said, I will deliver you to the promised land. In our natural eyes, we think that was the land of Israel, but in our supernatural mind, we know It was to the kingdom of heaven. And it was an eternal, an eternal deliverance, not a temporal one. Moses, like all of us, was given a promise by God that his people would be delivered into the promised land, and Moses believed him. And it was because of his belief that his destination was secure. We celebrate at this time of year 50 days from the deliverance of the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh. You know, on that 50th day, God called Moses up to the mountain and said, Moses, I will make for you these tablets. Place upon them the words. And the tradition and Judaism is to take two loaves of bread and wave them between the Lord. And as I begin to look at these two loaves of bread, I see how interesting they are. And when I bring them together, what's in my hand? It looks like the Ten Commandments and the tablets, just as God described them. When Moses went up to the mountain on that day, there was rumbling, and there was thunder, and there was smoke, and there was fire, and the shofar blast was so loud. And Moses came down on that 50th day 
And what did he find before him but idol worshipers? And God responded, and 3,000 died. And 1,400 years later, as the disciples gathered in the upper room 50 days after the resurrection of Messiah, how interesting is it that there was thunder and there was tongues of fire and there was a loud sound And instead of writing the law on their stones, he wrote it on their hearts. And as they came down from that upper room, speaking in a language that each could understand, 3,000 got saved. 3,000 had died. 3,000 now saved. He gave them the law 50 days after the exodus. He gave them the spirit 50 days after the resurrection. He wrote it on tablets of stone on Sinai. He wrote it on their hearts in the upper room. And from that point forward, the spirit was available to every person for the asking. Even to this day, the spirit is available to each one of you for the asking. And when I started talking about our journey with Moses, I said it was Moses' destiny that was fulfilled in the upper room that night. And you say, how could that be? He was dead 1,400 years. Fourteen hundred years later, after an event described in Numbers chapter 11 and verses 16 and 17, Fourteen hundred years later, his destiny was fulfilled. The Lord said to Moses, bring me seventy of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. Continuing in verse 24, so Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. In verse 26, however, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent, yet the spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. On that same day that the rumbling on the mountain took place, 1,400 years later, they gathered in the upper room. As Moses tried to lead the children of Israel, he pleaded, I wish that the Spirit was available to all of them. And there it was on that day in the upper room, At Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, that the Spirit fell and now became available for everyone, to everyone, for the asking. 1,400 years after Moses' destination was secure, after he went on to his destination, his destiny became fulfilled. Because he believed. Because the words he spoke came to pass that day in the upper room. It was Moses' prayer, his petition. I wish that the Spirit was available to all God's people. And it was. And on that day, 2,000 years ago, 
the Spirit became available to everyone for the asking. And for each one of us, we have to ask the question, do we know our destination? Do we know where we're going to wind up? Are we sure of where we're going? The Word of God says that no one comes to the Father but through the Son. And those who were gathered in the upper room on that day that shared in the outpouring of God's Spirit all believed in God's plan of salvation. <clears throat> they all believed in God's plan of atonement. That same plan that was laid out in Leviticus, that same plan that was explained to us in Exodus, that it was the blood of the Lamb poured out that delivered us from the hand of bondage and the hand of Pharaoh. God sent a Lamb to deliver us at Passover. And 50 days later, he sent the law to us. And then he sent the real Lamb of God. Not the one that delivered us from bondage, but the one that delivered us from bondage to sin. Not the one that secured our life in the promised land, but the one that secured our life in heaven. In Leviticus 17 and 11, in the Torah, it says that without the shedding of blood. That the life of a thing is in the blood. And the blood's for making atonement. We know in 70 AD the altar was destroyed and no longer was there a place to bring that sacrifice. In the prophecy and the visions of Daniel it was clear that the anointed one would be cut off before the destruction of the second temple. And the only one to come and to fulfill all of the prophecies that had a timeline was Yeshua, Jesus. A life given so that all could be saved. blood that was shed to make atonement for all of us for all of our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord when we started our worship set I said that we freely can enter the holy of holies but now we have to enter it through the shed blood of Messiah When I see that vision of the curtain being written too, I see a father is grieving as he tore his garment. The veil that kept us from him. Now through Messiah, we had access. Moses' petition was, I wish that the Spirit would be available to all God's people. And it is. It is for the asking, but you must ask. You say, Rabbi Eric, how do I ask? You say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I ask Yeshua, Jesus, into my heart. And I believe that he died for me, that he poured out his blood for me, that his life was in his blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. But because of his death and his resurrection and him sitting at the right hand of the Father, just like it says, the Lord said to my Lord, and because he lives, I can live forever. It seems like a simple thing. You say, Rabbi, I'm Jewish. You say, I'm Jewish too. And he fulfilled all the prophecies that we were looking for. 
He fulfilled every test that the rabbis had. Blindness, raising people from the dead, healing leprosy, deliverance of a dumb spirit, all the things our people looked for, all the requirements. He did all that and so much more. You say, but Rabbi, I'm not Jewish. How can I accept the Jewish Messiah? Well, he came for you too. The Word of God says God is no respecter of persons, either for the good or for the bad. He came for me, and he came for you. As Yeshua stood there in the temple and he looked out, what he saw was men on the lower level and women on the upper level and Jewish people in the temple and Gentiles in the courtyard. And Paul wrote and said, no longer will there be male and female, Jew and Greek, because together freely we worship together. Together we become one in Messiah. Together the Spirit is available to all of us. But we must ask. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads now and turn your eyes within. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know where you're going when you die? And if you have the slightest bit of hesitation, the slightest bit of uncertainty, I want to clear it up for you right now and give you the opportunity to say yes to the promised Jewish Messiah, to Yeshua, to Jesus. And once your destination is secure, you too, like Moses, can begin to fulfill your destiny. And it's never too late. Moses was 80. And if God could use him, he can use you and I. And so if you've never said yes to the promised Jewish Messiah, and you'd like to say that prayer, just slip up your hand and I'll say that prayer with you. Is there anybody here tonight? I see that hand. Is there anyone else that wants to say that prayer? To secure your destination so you may live your life fully and flow on the destiny that God has for you. Is there anyone else? Don't let this night pass you by. It's a glorious night. It's a wonderful night. The Spirit of the Lord is available to you for the asking. And all you have to do is say yes and slip up your hand. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone? Let's stand to our feet. To the one who raised her hand and to anyone else that wants to say this prayer. And if you've already said the prayer, why don't you say it along with me just as an encouragement. And to the one who raised their hand and anyone else, just repeat what I'm about to say. Dear Father, I thank you, Father God, that you sent Yeshua to be my atonement. I ask him into my heart right now. I believe he died for me. And on the third day he rose again. And that right now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Interceding for me. And because he lives, I can live tonight and forevermore. Tonight, my destination is secure. Today, I flow in my destiny. I praise you and thank you, Father. And I thank you that I can live forevermore. I'm sorry I've sinned against you. I love you, Lord. I thank you for the breath you breathe in me. The breath of life. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, the word of God says in Luke that if you cannot profess me before man, I can't profess you before the Father in heaven. You can't be ashamed of the decision you just made. 
So for the, well, the one person who just put up their hand and said that prayer, and to anyone else who said that prayer for the first time, come down, just shake my hand. Or Venus, give me a hug. Thank you. Thank you. The best decision you ever made, Venus. God bless you. Is there anyone else that wants to come forward? Well, let me pray for all of you right now before we close our service. Lord, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for supernatural breakthrough this night, Father God. Let this be the beginning and not the end, Father God, of breakthrough, Lord God, of new work that you're doing in each life that's here, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, with grateful hearts for the mighty work you're doing through Beth Hillel, Father God. That you continue to use us, Lord God. We just hunger for more of you. Lord God, we're reminded that you don't want us to do more for you. You want us to do more with you. We thank you, Father God, that you are in the prayer answering business, Lord God. You're moving in this house tonight and forevermore. We will release all fear, all worry, all strife, anger, and bitterness, Father God, into your hands. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Yeshua's name, amen.